We do have quiz three today, so uh, we, we will be covering some things up here at the front, uh, but otherwise I'll give you a good half hour at least to uh, complete quiz three at the end. Uh, it's just on recent material, DFS, BFS, and graph algorithms. Uh, but I wanted to continue first with what we were talking about yesterday uh, with DFS and BFS applications. And uh, the, today's theme, we're actually going to look at two different algorithms today. But they both basically do the same thing. They take potentially large graphs and they simplify them and to give them more structure without disrupting too much the topology of the graph itself. And the reason that you'd want to do something like this is if you've got a very large graph, if you can, if you can take that graph and transform it into a much smaller graph, then all of your algorithms that you're going to run on it are going to be a lot, uh, a lot more efficient. They're a lot, a, a lot faster, right? Uh, but you still want to preserve some sort of topology of the graph. In this first one, we're going to the topology that we're going to preserve are strongly connected components. Uh, for uh, given a directed graph, not necessarily acyclic, uh, what we want to do is we want to condense it into str uh, the strongly connected components. In other words, we want to take this large directed graph and we want to, f to, uh, to compress it, to condense it down into its essential components. Uh, uh, two, two vertices are strongly connected if there exists a directed path from x to y, uh, x and y are strongly connected, if and only if there's a path from x to y, directed, and there's a path from y to x. So in other words, if you start at x, you can get to y, but you also have a guarantee that from y, you can get back to x. If you don't have that guarantee, then those two uh, vertices are not strongly connected. Uh, they would be in different strongly connected components. So here's the idea for our algorithm. It's, a D, it's an application of DFS. All we're going to do is we're going to, uh, one, we're going to run DFS. And we're going to make special note of the finishing timestamps, I believe, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Keeping track, keep track of finishing timestamps. All right, this is one of the artifacts that we built when we, uh, or that we kept track of when we ran DFS. Then two, what we're going to do is we're going to compute the, what's called the transpose graph. And we'll use g to the t here. What is transpose? Well, if you've got a matrix here and you look along the diagonal and you flip along the diagonal so that you're taking the top right and making it the bottom left, you're, this is kind of like an axis that you're spinning it around. Basically, you're reversing the direction of everything. right? In other words, the orientation orientation of edges, remember it's a directed graph, is reversed. And we call it a transpose graph because if you represent that graph as a, an adjacency matrix and you take the transpose, that exactly corresponds to reversing all the edges. If I went to J in the original graph, then transposing this means that J goes to I in the transpose graph. Okay. Then three, we're going to run DFS again on g to the t, uh, but in the uh, finish order of step one. Right. So uh, there is. A, I didn't specify a, a, a next. A property over here, like uh, in, the, in step one, like you do have in your homework, like go in lexicographic order or anything like that. It's arbitrary; it doesn't matter. But down here, it's no longer arbitrary. We're going to go in the uh, in the order that the finishing timestamps in the original graph gave. Then, any time you restart DFS, is a new strongly connected component. And from this, you can build a new graph. Then you build a new graph, where the vertices 
are the strongly connected components. And the edges are between components. Right? And we'll look at an example here. Okay. So here's my graph. Right? Uh, it's got seven vertices here. So here, th this is my graph. Step one, let's go ahead and perform a DFS. Okay. So again, it, it doesn't matter where you start. I'll go ahead and go in lexiographic order. So the, uh, the, the order that I'll start, I'll start it at one. Right? Remember, I'll go ahead and keep track of everything. Fini uh, discovery timestamps, finishing timestamps, and uh, uh, coloration to indicate that you've already visited something. So this becomes gray, right? A. Uh, and then uh, we look at the neighborhood here, and that's D, B, and E. We'll go in lexiographic order. So we'll go to B next. Color it gray. Remember, this is DFS. We go as deep as possible. From B, we're connected to C and E. We are connected to A, but that's, that's an incoming edge, so that's not part of B's neighborhood. Only C and E are part of its neighborhood. So three, and this gets colored gray. From C, we can go to D or F, but this is lexiographic next, so four, gray. Uh, from D, we can get to G, so five. And it's gray. And then we can get to F, 6. At which point, now we start uh, caring about the finishing timestamps. So 7, right? And then this gets colored into uh, black. Of it's, it's done, right? Because now we're backtracking. Uh, this goes 8, uh, 9. And then we come back over here, 10. And this gets colored black, black. Uh, and then we backtrack all the way to B. And that's 11. Or we're not, oops, sorry, we're not done yet with B. Why? Because we can go to E, 11. But of course, then we're done with that. So 12, 13, and 14. And then uh, by the end, they are all black. OK? That's a DFS performance on this one right here. Now let's go ahead and draw the transpose, the, the reverse uh, um, graph, right? A was connected to B in the original, so when I transpose that, now it's going the other way. B is connected to A. Uh, C and uh, so th this one gets reversed, but then they, both of them were there, so that essentially stays the same. Uh, D gets reversed. G, these again were both here, so we're, we're there again. Uh, F goes to G now instead. Uh, F goes to C. C goes to E. And then both of these are outgoing edges back to A. And then we can go to A from D. Did I get everything? Looks like it. All right. This is the transpose graph. All right. So we've computed, uh, we compute the transpose graph. Okay. And again, that's just taking the adjacency matrix, flipping it over. So three, D, uh, we'll perform a DFS on G sub T, but we'll perform it in the order of the finishing timestamps here. So in particular, where do I start here? Oh, sorry, uh, I should have I should have specified in D send uh, in D sending order with respect to WRT, the finish timestamps from DFS on G. So descending order. So what's the, where do I go first? A, because that has the maximum finishing timestamp. I'm looking at all the finishing timestamps, and I'm going in descending order, so the first one would be A. So let's do a DFS on A. I go, I'll go ahead and keep track of the, uh, the discovery time here. This gets colored gray. Tell me about the neighborhood of A, though. 
it's empty. So we end up finishing it and coloring it black. And then now we need to restart DFS. But before we do that, let's understand why that happened. Characterize A up here in this original graph here. What kind of vertex is A, since it's got all outgoing uh, edges? That's a source. And if you reverse everything, a source becomes a sink. Right? So A is not strongly connected to anything other than itself. Uh, from A, I can go to a lot of other vertices. But from any other vertex, is it possible to get back to A? No. So A, by itself, is going to be a strongly connected component. And I'll put it into a box over here. This is going to be my condensation graph over here. Every time I restart, I get a new con a component. So 14, and I have to restart my DFS. Uh, what, uh, what, which one's next? In, remember, in descending order with respect to the finishing timestamps of the original, so it would be B. So this goes 3. From B, I can go to A, but of course that's already black, so it's done. Uh, and so my only other choice is go to go over to C, 4. From C, I can go to a lot of places. I can go back to B, but of course it's colored gray now. C is colored gray as well. I can go to E as the is my only option, 5. Now from E, I can go to a black vertex or a gray vertex, but you know uh, I only go to unvisited vertices. So this gets colored black, and it's done. We backtrack. This gets colored black because uh, its neighborhood is now empty, 7. And then we backtrack 8 here, and this gets colored black. So what I have here is a strongly connected component. B, C, and E. The interpretation there is that in the original graph, I can go from B to C, well, directly, but I can also go to E. How? Well, directly right there. From E, I can go back to B. How? Well, I can go over to C and then over to B. From, uh, so basically, I, I, if, if you've got a cycle, uh, well, here's a cycle, right? But also, you've got this cycle right here. This big cycle means that I can actually collapse those three nodes. The interpretation is, if I'm in any one of these nodes, I can communicate back and forth. So if I can do that, then there's really no reason to keep all of these nodes in memory. I can go ahead and collapse them down and create a smaller graph that has the same topology, right? that has the same connectivity. Okay. Start over again because you still have unvisited vertices. So among D, F, and G, D, F, and G, which one has the lar largest finishing timestamp? It would be D. So I'll go ahead and start again my DFS at D. Color it gray. Look at the neighborhood here. I can go to G. I can go to C, by the way, but I can't get back. So or, uh, it's already bla uh, blacked out. Uh, so 10. And now from G, can I go anywhere else? This is already gr colored out gray. So no, I start backtracking. This is now black. And 12. And there's nowhere else to go. So I've started again. D and G, they're going to be another strongly connected component. Because from D, I can get to G. From G, I can get to D. And then the last one, of course, will be uh, 13 and 14. F is its own strongly connected component. The interpretation here is, what was it up here? F is a sink. So down here, it becomes a source. Nothing can get to it. Now, there's my, this is my condensation graph here. Condensation graph. It's not complete yet because those are my nodes, right? Those are the strongly connected components. But what is the relationship between the strongly connected components? For this, we need to look back at the original graph. From this connected component, and then this is another connected component, this is a connected component, and these, this is a connected component, I can get to which connected components? I can get to this connected component by going to B, and then once I'm in B, I can go to anything within that connected component. So that tells me that I can get from A to any one of these vertices. Right? But I've simplified it by collapsing it down, by condensing it. From A, I can get to D, so I can get to that connected component. From A, I can get to E, but I've already taken care of that connected component. Basically, I've, I've removed the redundant kind of edges 
uh, with respect to strongly connected, uh, or strong connectivity, right? From D, I can get to G. Uh, from G, I can get to F. So this connected component, this connected component, uh, strongly connected component, can get to this strongly connected component. And finally, from this strongly connected component, I can get to F. Right? And what else? I can also get to D. So this, the interpretation here is that A is now a, uh, a source, right? F it was always a sink right, in the original. Uh, but I've also got the topology that I can go to D I, uh, or G directly by going to its strongly connected component or by going to this strongly connected component and then over there. Right? This is a simplification of this network up here, basically, uh, that, re that reduces the number of vertices, reduces the number of edges. And it also has the nice property that what kind of graph is this now? What can you say about this graph that you couldn't say about this graph up here? B, I can, uh, I can go to E, and then I can from E I can go to C, and then back to B. I've got a cycle. Do I have a cycle over here? No. Why? What if I had a cycle? A or X da, 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 goes all the way to Y. Y goes all the way to back to X. That would be a strongly connected component. Basically, the condensation graph gives me a DAG. Right? Remember what a DAG is? It's a directed, acyclic graph. Why do we like acyclic graphs? Well, if they're undirected, we like them because they're trees. We have more structure. If we have more structure, that means that we're not going to get caught in any cycles. Right? More structure means that we, uh, there, uh, we can exploit it. Right? So a lot of graph algorithms are taking very general, generic graphs and trying to impose a structure while preserving some other property. Not all properties can be preserved, of course, because you are fundamentally changing the graph. But the connectivity properties are essentially uh, 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 preserved here. Right? I forget the technical term for this, but I think that it's called a homeomorphism. Uh, that you're mapping one class of graphs to another class of graphs and preserving some uh, property. And that's either a, you, you have a lot of these morphisms. You have endomorphisms, homeomorphisms, homomorphisms, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, isomorphisms, right? Uh, two, uh, two graphs, you, uh, hopefully you checked it out in 235, but two graphs are isomorphic if and only if. Uh, uh, you, you can rearrange the labels of all of the vertices, and, you, uh, and then you can have the original same graph. In other words, they have the same basic rigid structure. This is less uh, of a rigid structure because we are fundamentally changing. We, we, in fact, we've, we've cut out some, many of the uh, edges already. Right? We've, we've condensed seven vertices down to only one, two, three, four vertices, and we've cut out cycles, and we've done a bunch of other things. But we have uh, preserved some property, some useful property over here. Okay. All right, that's the idea. Uh, well, here, let, let's go back over here really quick and analyze it. DFS is, of course, going to be order n. It's uh, or n plus m if you want to. It's linear in any case, uh, and that second DFS is also going to be, of course order n. It's the exact same graph. What about computing the transpose of a graph? So if it's a, an adjacency matrix and you want to compute the transpose, uh, you could do it by generating a brand new matrix, and that would be order n squared, because you'd be copying the input and, uh, to another output. Or you could do it on the fly. Right? When you're doing this DFS down here, you, uh, you put it through a filter. Uh, and uh, if, if you're looking at i to j in your DFS, you simply just transpose those two things. So this, uh, th this part right here could be just simply interpreted as order one, uh, as long as you program it that way. Okay? So very efficient algorithm to, uh, to, to fundamentally change a graph to give it different properties. Another way that you can do that is by looking at what's, or computing what's called a minimum spanning tree. All right, so given a weighted 
undirected graph g equals v comma e. What we want to do, we want to build a network network backbone. All right. So the topology of the graph itself it could, be, it could be connected in many, many different ways. Uh, but what we're interested in is we're, we're interested in building a backbone. What we mean by a backbone is what we're, we're going to want a tree, right? We want a spanning tree. A tree, uh, which is a subset of edges of G, right? That spans G. In other words, uh, uh, any uh, any two vertices that were connected in G are still connected in T, in the tree T, a tree T, I'll call it that. All right? So that's what it means to span. And of course, we could cut out every single vertex, or we could cut out every single edge, uh, and we'd have our end vertices. We'd have a bunch of seeds instead of trees now. Uh, or we could cut them out so that we divide the graph into two parts, two connected components. Uh, and now we've got a forest instead of a tree. But what we want is a tree. So what we're going to do is we're going to assume that the graph is connected. Right? We'll assume that it's connected not disconnected. So that the tree that we make is not a forest, it's going to actually be a single tree. But we want to minimize the overall, uh, the, uh, the overall uh, tree weight. That is the sum of all edge weights in T. Okay. As a very small example here, let's just look at a tree, or look at a graph here. Uh, I'll go ahead and make it uh, six vertices, A, B, C, D, E, and F. And we'll connect things in a myriad of ways. And We'll go ahead and give edge. Uh, now, by the way, you could have the default edge weights, where uh, the edge weights are all one, right? And then uh, the minimum spanning tree would be any spanning tree whatsoever, right? All you have to do is start removing edges until you have no more uh, cycles, and that's good enough. But what we want is one that is minimum. There, all right? So all of our edges have some weights, OK? Now, I could choose a, sp a spanning tree. So let's say that uh, this one, A goes to D, goes to uh, B, goes to E, F, and then C, and then F, uh, uh, like this. So 7, 4, 3, 3. 9 and 1. Is that a spanning tree, though? No, why? We've got a cycle right here. That's not a tree. OK, you caught me. Let's get rid of that. Let's get rid of that. Is that a spanning tree? No, because we don't have one tree. It doesn't span the entire graph. So we need at least one. I'll go ahead and restore this. All right. Now, what's the weight of this tree? 1 plus 9 plus 3 plus 3 plus 7 equal to 23. Can we do better? Is there one that's less weight? Well, what if instead of deleting this edge, which was 4, I'll restore that. What if I had deleted this edge? Now, is that a spanning tree? It spans, 
it's a tree, so it's a spanning tree. But instead of seven, I have four, which is going to be only 20. That's even better. Can you do better than that? Right? That's where we need an algorithm to do it. I'll come back to this example and we'll run this algorithm. But first, I need to describe it. Right? And the person that gets credit for it, there, there, there are half a dozen uh, minimum spanning tree algorithms. Uh, the two that uh, are usually covered are Kruskal's and Prim's. And so we'll go ahead and cover those. Kruskal's. Kruskal's algorithm, because it's the simplest, or at least conceptually it's the simplest, uh, to actually program it is actually a little bit more difficult than uh, the one that we're uh, the next one that I'm going to show you on Monday, which is Prim's. But I still like to show both because Prim's gives a nice uh, segue into Dijkstra's algorithm, which is the single source shortest path. It's basically the same concept, and so if you see the same concept twice in two different algorithms to solve two different problems, it kind of reinforces it. Uh, but the Kruskal's algorithm uh, algorithm is extremely simple conceptually. One will sort the edges uh, by weight in increasing or non-decreasing order, uh, in, in increasing order, right? Then for each edge, in that order of course, for each edge, if it does not induce a cycle, that is create a cycle, add it to the tree. And initially, I should have said, initially, the tree is, has no edges. But of course, it has all the vertices, OK? Three, or I guess until, dot, 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 until when? When do I stop? Why did you say that this was a tree? And when I erased four and had seven, why did you say that was a tree? How many edges are going to be in a tree with six vertices? Five. How many edges are going to be in a tree with 10 vertices? Nine. How many, how many edges are going to be in a tree with n vertices, n minus 1, until you have n minus 1 edges. At which point you can stop and output the tree. You don't even need to look at the rest of the list. OK? All right. Let's do it for this graph right here. So here's my edge orders, or edge or, uh, edges considered, and the result. So which edge do I consider first? If I were to sort these in increasing order, AD has a weight of 1, BC has a weight of 1. Doesn't matter. Go ahead and uh, choose, the, uh, choose arbitrarily. Right? So AD, I'll go ahead and go ahead in lexicographic order. And I'll go ahead and keep track of the weight as well. And whether or not I took that edge. I'll go ahead and color it. The Sharpie, if I took it. Otherwise, I'll leave it there. So, do I take it In, initially? What, what does my tree look? Uh, what, what does my tree uh, look like? A, B, C, D, E, and F. Okay. I will go ahead and copy it down here. Initially, it's empty. It's, it, it has all the vertices. So the vertex set is the same, but the edge set starts with an empty set. You don't have any edges yet. AD, well, if I added that over here, would I induce a cycle? No. So I'll go ahead and add it. And the result is that I added it. OK? Now, an interesting question would be, how do you know that it would induce a cycle? If you've got this, this uh, graph over here and you add an edge to it, well, now you've got a new graph. What question do you ask? Does it contain a cycle? Do we know how to do that? Do we know how to, given a, a graph G, uh, output yes, it has a cycle. Output no, it does not have a cycle. DFS or BFS? Right? It's undirected, so DFS or BFS would work. DFS, if you have a back edge or forward edge, which is the same thing. 
uh, or, uh, or BFS if you've got a cross edge. You would not have back edges or uh, forward edges in a BFS, right, as we, we analyzed yesterday. So I went ahead and added that. The next one that I consider is going to be BC with a weight of 1. Do I add it? BC? Test on this graph. Would adding that cause a cycle? Nope. So added uh, with a weight of 1. Okay. What's the next one I consider? DE with a weight of 2. Would adding that cause a cycle? Nope. So go ahead, add it. And I added. Okay. Uh, okay. Otherwise, it won't be interesting. <laughs> I didn't want to get myself into a corner there. All right, so what's the next one that I uh, consider? Uh, well, I've got three of them with, uh, with weights of three. Uh, so let's go ahead and consider which one? BD would be the next lexicographic. BD, and that has a weight of three. So adding BD, would that cause a cycle? Nope, so go ahead and add it. Problem with coming up with graphs on the fly is that they may not necessarily be interesting when you run through the algorithm. I want to get at least one edge that we reject here. In the next iteration here, we consider BE with a weight of 3. If I added it to that uh, graph over there, would it induce a, a cycle? Yes. So I reject it. Right? I omit it. Next one would be EF. And would, I add, would that induce a cycle? Nope. So go ahead and add it. And I added this one. Added. What's the next one I would consider? Oh, good. Why do I stop? I've got myself a tree now down here. All right? Uh, and I could have kept a counter. One, two, three, four, five, right? And once I hit five, then I would be done. Right? And I don't need to consider any of the rest of the list. What is my total weight? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, plus six, so ten. That is a minimum spanning tree. Is it the only minimum spanning tree? No. What else could I have done? Maybe I, instead of going in lexicographic order, I'll just go in a random order, and I could have done this one instead of this one. And I would have ended up with a, a different minimum spanning tree, but it would have still been minimum. right? It would have still been a weight of 10. It would have still connected everything, it just in a different manner. It doesn't matter if you come up with a different minimum spanning tree. Uh, all it matters is that you come with, up with a minimum spanning tree. Uh, and my pet peeve is that every, I, I've been calling it minimum spanning tree, but really it should be called minimal spanning tree uh, because there could be more than one. Right. Okay. All right. Questions so far? So, what about the analysis here? Okay. So, one, sorting. Sorting edges. What's that going to end up being? What does it cost you to sort edges? Quick sort, merge sort, Tim sort, whatever, right? It's going to be order what? N log n in general, but we're talking about edges. What what variable do we generally use for edges? M log m. In the worst case, if you want to look at this with respect to vertices, uh, well, how many vertices are there at most? n choose 2, which is going to be uh, m is at most n choose 2, which is going to be order n squared. So if you uh, want to substitute that in and get it in terms of n instead, then it's log 
what if I put n squared here? What happens to that square? Comes out front, becomes a constant. So this is really order n squared log n, which is essentially quasi-quadratic, uh, if you want to call it that. Right? Just like quasi-linear would be order n uh, m log m, that's quasi-linear. Right? Okay, so that's uh, that's pretty straightforward. For each edge, so order m in the worst case for each edge. The way that I presented it, we're going to add the edge, and then that's going to be constant, and then the creating a new graph, and then do DFS to test uh, if a cycle exists. Right. Now, DFS in general is going to be pretty expensive, right? It's going to be order n plus m, or something like that. Right. It's going to be maybe order n squared, if you want to look at it like, that way. And so if you're doing this for order m, which we, as we've said is order n squared, then a very loose analysis would mean that for each edge you're doing this DFS, a very loose analysis would lead you to say that this is order n to the fourth, which is actually quite terrible. But hold the phone here, right? This DFS, is it really going to be this bad? Let's go back to our example. Right? Of course, there were n uh, vertices to start out with. But in, uh, initially, how many, uh, how, many vertices, uh, how many edges did we have? On the first iteration, so iteration 1, the size of the graph, n, would be, of course be n, is, it's going to be invariant here. But how big was m? on the first iteration. Were there any uh, edges in there? Well, we added one edge, right? That's where, then we tested DFS. On the second iteration, we would have had two edges. Third iteration, we would have had three edges. Fourth iteration, we would have had five edges, dot, dot, dot. And then, of course, sometimes we reject edges, and then the size of the edge set doesn't increase. But eventually, we get down to an iteration n where we add the last edge, uh, or n minus 1, I guess. We add the last edge, and then we stop. Okay. So order m on a small, sparse graph is really only order n for sparse graphs. And in fact, there are even uh, uh, easier ways that you can do it. Right? But uh, for that, read a standard text. Uh, if you use a, uh, a data structure called the, uh, a disjoint union data structure, uh, where basically your question about whether or not it will induce a cycle, let's go ahead and reverse this. And at some point, we would have this, right? Um, well, here, let me forget about this. Let me draw a different picture. All right. OK. So suppose that we've got a connected component here. And we've got two vertices in the same connected component. If I were to draw, everything in this component is connected. If I were to draw any other, vert, uh, any other edge, what can you say uh, about uh, the act of drawing that edge? It would lead to a cycle. Here's another connected component. I, if I draw a, uh, an edge within that connected component, then you would say that it induces a cycle. However, if I have two separate disconnected components and I draw an edge between them, what can you say about that? Is that going to induce a cycle? No. So there, is, there exists a cycle if and only if the edge x, y induces a cycle. Uh, oh, here, here, let, let, me, let me rephrase this. Adding the edge x, y induces a cycle, creates a cycle, induces a cycle, if and only if 
x and y are in the same component, same connected component. OK? So you can actually change the question because of the nature of the algorithm. Rather than running a full DFS to see that, yes, there ex exists a cycle, what you can do is you can come up with another data structure that keeps track of a disjoint set. Disjoint set in that this is uh, set A, this is set B, and there's nothing between them. Now, the, uh, the, 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 the key insight to this data structure that we're not going to cover is that once you do draw that, uh, uh, that edge between them, they're no longer a disjoint cycle. What you need to do is you, uh, disjoint sets. You need to take their union and collapse them down into one connected component. Uh, but it's nice because as you connect more and more in the tree, uh, the number of connected components decreases, decreases, decreases. You start out with n distinct connected components, and then you, uh, you de decrease, uh, decrease those. And the uh, disjoint union, uh, disjoint set uh, union, whatever it's called, uh, data structure, can do all of these things efficiently. Given x and y, you can tell that x is in this set and y is in this set, and they're not the same. OK, go ahead and draw your, uh, your edge, because they would not induce a cycle. Or the answer would be that, no, they are in the same set, so don't draw that edge and move on. Right? Uh, and then eventually you'll need to collapse these two sets once you've drawn the edge between them. All of that stuff can be done in amortized constant time or something like that. And you can greatly improve on this analysis. Right? But it's not going to be this bad. All you need to do is realize that there's an amortization here, right? It's not going to be a full DFS on a full compli uh, complicated graph. It's actually only going to be order n. Right? And for each edge, eventually, uh, you, you know, in the worst case, you will get down to the end and you'll look at all of them. Uh, but there are uh, uh, smart ways around that. Okay. All right. So that is Kruskal's algorithm. Prim's algorithm is a little bit different, and we have, don't have an, an, nearly enough time to get started on it, but I will show that on Monday. Keep in mind that uh, we've got Monday, and your homework is due on Wednesday? OK. So Monday and Tuesday, we'll, we'll finish, definitely finish out uh, graph algorithms by then, uh, and then segue with Floyd's algorithm into uh, dynamic programming.